Welcome to Magical Dreamport Channel. Today, we're diving into Sherlock Holmes' famous tale, The Mystery of the Boscombe Valley. This classic adventure follows Holmes and Watson as they cleverly unravel the mysteries behind mysterious events. Watch on as we embark on a journey into the depths of this unforgettable detective story. The Boscombe Valley Mystery my wife and I were sitting at breakfast one morning when the maid brought in a telegram. It was from Sherlock Holmes, and it read, Have you a couple of days to spare? I've had a telegram from the west of England about the Boscombe Valley tragedy. She'll be glad if you will come with me. Air and scenery perfect. Leave Paddington by the 11.15. What do you say, dear? said my wife, looking across at me. Will you go? I really don't know what to say. I have a lot of work to do just now. Ah, Anstruther can handle it for you. You've been looking rather pale lately, and I think the change would do you good. Besides, you've always been interested in Mr. Sherlock Holmes's adventures. I can't deny that I've learned a lot from those adventures, I replied. If I'm going to go, I should get ready at once, for I have only half an hour. Thanks to my experience in Afghanistan, I had become a quick and always ready traveller. Since I only needed a few things, I packed quickly and took a cab to Paddington Station. When I arrived, Sherlock Holmes was pacing up and down the platform. His tall, thin figure seemed even taller with his long grey travelling coat and matching hat. It's good of you to come, Watson, he said. Having someone I can thoroughly rely on is crucial. The local force is always either useless or biased. If you take a corner seat, I'll get the tickets except for the large stack of documents Holmes brought. The compartment was entirely ours. He was sorting through these papers, reading, taking notes and thinking. We had passed Reading when he bundled the papers together and placed them on the rack above. What do you know about the case? he asked. Nothing. I haven't read the newspapers for a few days. The London press hasn't given many details anyway. I've just been sorting through the more relevant reports. In my opinion, this is one of those simple yet very difficult cases. Isn't that a bit contradictory? But it's perfectly true. A case's uniqueness always offers a good clue. The more featureless and commonplace a case is, the harder it is to solve. Here, however, a serious charge has been made against the murdered man's son. A murder then? Well, that's what is alleged. I accept nothing until I've examined it myself. Let me give you the facts as I know them so far. Boscombe Valley is in Herefordshire, near Ross, a rural area. The largest landowner there is a Mr John Turner, who made his fortune in Australia before returning to his homeland. He has let his farm at Hatherley to Mr Charles McCarthy, who also came from Australia. It's natural they would want to live near each other, having known each other from the colony. Turner being wealthier, has McCarthy as a tenant, but they seem to have remained on good terms, spending a lot of time together. McCarthy has an 18-year-old son, and Turner has a daughter of similar age. Both men have been widowed for some time. They lived secluded from the surrounding English families. The McCarthys, being sports enthusiasts, were often seen at the local horse races. McCarthy had two servants, a middle-aged man and a young girl while Turner employed at least half a dozen. That's what I've learned about the families. Now, on to the incident. Last Monday, June 3rd, McCarthy left his house at Hatherley at around three in the afternoon, heading towards Boscombe Pool, a lake formed by the spread of the river that runs through the valley. That same morning, he had gone to Ross with his groom and had told the man he was in a hurry because he had an important appointment at three. However, he never returned from that appointment alive. The distance from Hatherley Farm to Boscombe Pool is about a quarter of a mile. Two people saw him pass that way. One was an unnamed elderly woman, and the other was William Crowder, the gamekeeper employed by Mr Turner. Both witnesses stated that Mr McCarthy was walking alone. However, the gamekeeper added that a few minutes after Mr McCarthy passed, he saw his son, Mr James McCarthy, walking in the same direction with a gun under his arm. According to the gamekeeper, the son was following his father at a distance, but he didn't think much of it until he heard about the unfortunate incident that evening. After the McCarthys were seen by the gamekeeper, 
they were seen by another person. The Boscombe Pool area is a wooded region surrounded by grass and reeds. A 14-year-old girl named Patience Moran, the daughter of the lodgekeeper of the Boscombe Valley estate, was picking flowers in the woods. She stated that she saw Mr McCarthy and his son arguing violently near the edge of the woods close to the pool. She witnessed Mr McCarthy speaking harshly and saw the son raising his hand as if to strike his father. Terrified by this aggressive behaviour, she ran home and told her mother that she had seen the McCarthys quarrelling near Boscombe Pool and feared they would fight. Just as she was saying this, young McCarthy arrived at their home, saying he had found his father dead in the woods and asking for the gamekeeper's help. He was without his gun and hat and had fresh bloodstains on his right hand and the sleeve of his shirt. They followed him to the grassy spot by the pool where the body lay. The deceased had been struck multiple times on the head with a heavy, blunt object. The injuries could have been caused by the butt of the son's gun, which was found a few steps from the body. Under these circumstances, the young man was immediately arrested and charged with willful murder at the inquest on Tuesday. He was brought before the magistrates at Ross on Wednesday, and the case was adjourned until the next session. These are the main facts in the possession of the police. It couldn't be a more damning case, I remarked. All these details point to one culprit. Evidence is a very tricky word, replied Holmes thoughtfully. It seems to point in one direction, but if you shift your perspective even slightly, it can point in an entirely different one. We must acknowledge that the situation appears strongly against the young man, and the probability that he is guilty is high. However, a few people, including Miss Turner, the daughter of the neighbouring farm owner, believe in the defendant's innocence. They have engaged our mutual acquaintance Lestrade to solve the matter. Unable to do so, he passed the case to me. Hence, two middle-aged gentlemen, who would otherwise be having breakfast at home, are speeding westward at 50 miles an hour this morning. The facts are so clear that I'm afraid you won't get much out of this case, I said. There is nothing more deceptive than an obvious fact, he replied, smiling. Besides, we may encounter some realities that Lestrade has undoubtedly overlooked. You know how I debunk his theories. For example, while I can clearly see that your bedroom window is on the right, I doubt Lestrade could notice such an obvious detail. How could you possibly know that? My dear friend, I know you well. I am aware of your prominent trait of military precision. You shave every morning, and at this time of year, you must do so in sunlight. The fact that the shaving gets worse as you move to the left, and that this flaw becomes more pronounced at the lower corner of your chin, clearly indicates that the room is less illuminated on that side than on the other. I mention this not to criticise someone as meticulous as you, but to illustrate observation and reasoning. This is my method, and I hope it will be useful in solving the case before us. There are also a few other minor points from the inquiry worth noting. What are they? It appears the young man was not arrested immediately, but only after returning to Hatherley Farm. When the police inspector went to arrest him, he said he wasn't surprised at all. This statement removed any doubts from the jury's minds. It sounds like a full confession. I exclaimed excitedly, no, because he then declared his innocence. Isn't that at least a suspicious statement, given such a sequence of events? Quite the opposite, said Holmes. This is the brightest spot I can see through the clouds at the moment. No matter how innocent he may be, he couldn't be so foolish as to not see that the circumstances were entirely against him. I also doubt the claim that he was surprised or angry at his arrest, because under such circumstances, such surprise or anger would be entirely unnatural and would only be seen as a tactic by someone involved in some trickery. His honest acceptance of the situation suggests either his innocence or his composed and solid character. The signs of self-reproach and regret in his statement seem to me more like indicators of a healthy mind than a guilty one. I shook my head negatively. Many men have been hanged with less evidence, I remarked. Yes, and many men have been wrongly hanged. What does the young man say about the events? I'm afraid that aside from a few positive statements, there isn't much hope for those who believe in him. 
Here, you can read it yourself. He took out an issue of the local Hereford paper from the stack and pointed to the paragraph containing the unfortunate young man's statement. I read it carefully. It said, The deceased son, Mr. James McCarthy, was called and gave the following statement. I have been in Bristol for three days. I returned on Monday morning. When I arrived home, my father was not there. The maid said he had gone to Ross with John Cobb, the groom. Shortly after, I heard the sound of carriage wheels outside, and when I looked out the window, I saw my father getting out of the carriage and walking quickly across the field. I did not notice which direction he went. A little later, I took my gun and set off for Boscombe Pool, where there are many rabbits. On the way, I saw the gamekeeper, William Crowder, who mentioned this in his testimony, but he is mistaken in thinking I was following my father. I had no idea he was ahead of me. When I was a few hundred yards from the pool, I heard the koofy call, which was a signal between my father and me. I hurried forward and found him waiting by the pool. He seemed very surprised to see me and asked rather harshly what I was doing there. We had a heated argument which nearly came to blows. This was due to my father's very irritable temperament. Seeing that his anger was getting out of control, I left him and started back towards Hatherley Farm. I had not gone more than 150 yards when I heard a terrible scream behind me. I ran back and found him dying. His head was terribly injured. I dropped my gun and took him in my arms, but he died almost immediately. I stayed with him for a few minutes, then went to Mr. Turner's lodgekeeper's house to seek help. When I returned after hearing the scream, I saw no one else around. I have no idea how he got his injuries. He was not a well-liked man due to his cold and somewhat frightening manner, but as far as I know, he had no enemies. I have nothing more to say about this matter. Inspector. Did your father say anything before he died? Accused. He mumbled a few words, but all I could make out was something like a rat. Inspector. What did you understand from that? Accused. It meant nothing to me. I thought he was delirious. Inspector. What was the cause of your last quarrel with your father? Accused. I do not wish to say. Inspector. I am afraid I must press you on this point. Accused. It is really impossible for me to tell. But I assure you, it had no connection with his tragic end. Inspector. The court will decide on that. I must point out that your refusal to answer will raise serious suspicions about you in the upcoming investigations. Accused. I am determined to refuse. Inspector, you mentioned that the cooey call was a signal between you and your father. Accused. Yes, it was. Inspector, then how could he call out to you without seeing you or even knowing that you had returned from Bristol? Accused, with noticeable confusion. I don't know. Juror, when you heard the scream and returned, finding your father severely injured, did you notice anything suspicious? Accused. Nothing at all. At least nothing definite. Inspector. What do you mean by that? Accused. I was so distressed and concerned for my father that I couldn't think of anything else. But as I ran forward, I had a vague sense of something on my left, something grey, perhaps a coat or a plaid shawl. When I looked around, after getting up from my father, it was gone. You mean it disappeared before you went for help? Yes, it was gone. Can you identify what it was? No, it was just a sense that something was there. How far was it from the body? About 15 metres. And how far from the woods? About the same distance. So it disappeared when you were about 15 metres away from it? Yes, but my back was turned. The inquiry ended here. The inspector seems to have been a bit harsh on young McCarthy, I said, looking at the column in the paper. He focused on the inconsistency of his father calling him without knowing he had returned, his refusal to reveal the cause of their quarrel, and his brief explanation of his father's last words. Naturally, all this goes against the boy, just as the inspector suggested. Holmes quietly laughed and stretched out in his soft chair. You and the inspector, he said are both overlooking some strong points in favour of the young man. Are you not aware that the accused is claiming both too much and too little imagination? Too little? 
because he couldn't invent a plausible cause for the quarrel to win the jury's sympathy. Too much, because he talks about the dying man's last words being something like rat, and his vague account of the disappearing garment. No, sir. I will begin with the assumption that the young man's statements are true, and we shall see where that takes us. But for now, I will read my book, and do not wish to discuss this case further until we arrive at the scene. We should reach there in about twenty minutes after having lunch in Swindon. We arrived at the charming little town of Ross at around four o'clock, after passing through the beautiful Stroud Valley and the Severn. On the platform, a thin, rat-like man with shifty, cunning eyes was waiting for us, his light brown coat and leather trousers, which did not fit his surroundings, made it easy to identify him as Lestrade from Scotland Yard. He took us to the Hereford Arms, where he had reserved a room for us. I've arranged for a carriage, said Lestrade, as we sat down for a cup of tea. I remember your energetic nature, and know you won't be able to rest until you've visited the crime scene. That's very kind of you, replied Holmes. It's all a matter of barometric pressure. Lestrade was puzzled. I'm having a little trouble understanding you, he said. What's the barometer reading? Holmes asked. Hmm, 29. The sky is clear and there's no wind. I have a fresh pack of cigarettes, and this couch is quite comfortable, unlike the usual countryside inns. I don't think I'll be needing the carriage tonight. Lestrade laughed heartily. You must have already solved the case with what you've read in the newspapers, he said. The more you look into it, the clearer it becomes. But of course, a determined lady is not to be refused, especially one as resolute as she is. She's heard all about you and insisted on hearing your opinion, despite my repeated assurances that you couldn't do more than I've already done. But here she is now, arriving in her carriage. As he finished speaking, one of the most beautiful women I had ever seen burst into the room, her bright violet eyes slightly parted lips, and the blush on her cheeks indicated that her excitement and anxiety had temporarily overcome her natural shyness. After scanning us one by one, her woman's intuition led her to my friend. Oh, Mr. Sherlock Holmes, she cried. I'm so glad you've come. I have some facts to tell you. I know James didn't do it. I know it, and I want you to start your work with that in mind. Don't have any doubt about it. We've known each other since we were children, and I know his faults better than anyone. But he is so kind-hearted that he wouldn't hurt a fly. Everyone who knows him understands how absurd this accusation is. I hope we can clear his name, Miss Turner, said Sherlock Holmes. You can be assured that I will do my best. You know the case, don't you? Have you come to any conclusions? Have you found any cracks or holes in it? Do you also believe he is innocent? There is a possibility, said Holmes. There, you see, she cried, throwing her head back and giving Lestrade a defiant look. You hear that? He's giving me hope. Lestrade shrugged his shoulders. I'm afraid my colleague is being a bit hasty in forming conclusions, he said. But he's right. Oh, I know he's right. James didn't do it. And the quarrel with his father. I'm sure the reason he didn't tell the inspector is because it involved me. In what way? asked Holmes. There's no point in hiding things any more. James and his father disagreed on some matters regarding me. Mr. McCarthy wanted us to marry. James and I have always loved each other like siblings, but he's still young and inexperienced and, well, naturally, he didn't want to do something like that. They constantly quarrelled about it, and I believe this last one was one of those. And what about your father? asked Holmes. Did he approve of such a match? No, he was against it too. No one approved except Mr. McCarthy. The young lady blushed under Holmes's sharp and scrutinising gaze. Thank you for this information, he said. Would it be possible to see your father if I came tomorrow? I'm afraid the doctor wouldn't allow it. The doctor? Yes, didn't you know? My poor father's health had already been failing for the past few years. This last incident has completely broken him down. He can't get out of bed. Dr. Willows says he's a wreck and that his nervous system is destroyed. Mr. McCarthy was the only man who knew my father from the old days in Victoria. In Victoria, was it? Well, 
That's significant. Yes, in the mines. It must be. I understand that Mr. Turner made his fortune in gold mines. Yes, that's correct. Thank you, Miss Turner. You've been very helpful. If anything new comes up tomorrow, you'll let me know. You'll probably go to see James in prison. Oh, if you do, Mr. Holmes, please tell him that I believe in his innocence. I will, Miss Turner. I must go home now, for my father is very ill and cannot bear my absence. Goodbye. God bless you. She left the room as excitedly as she had entered. The clatter of her carriage wheels soon faded into silence. I'm ashamed of you, Holmes, said Lestrade haughtily after a few minutes of silence. Why do you give her false hopes? I'm not a soft-hearted man, but this is cruel. Sherlock Holmes, I believe I have found a way to clear James McCarthy, he said. Do you have permission to see him in prison? Yes, but only the two of us. Then I must reconsider my decision not to go out. Have we enough time to catch the Hereford train and see him tonight? More than enough. Then let's do it. Watson, I fear you'll be bored, but I'll be back in a few hours. I walked with them to the station, then wandered the streets of the small town before returning to the hotel and reclining on the couch to read a novel. Now, the plot of the novel seemed feeble in comparison to the deep mystery we were trying to solve, and my attention kept wandering. Finally, I set the book aside and decided to think over the day's events. Assuming we accepted the young man's unhappy story as entirely true, then what disaster had occurred between his departure from his father and his return to the cries at the scene? It must have been terrible and deadly. What could it have been? What did the shape of the wounds tell me from a medical perspective? The investigation had been printed verbatim in the weekly town newspaper I brought to the room. The doctor's report stated that the third left occipital bone and the left half of the articular bone had been broken by a blunt weapon. It was clear that such a blow came from behind. This was somewhat in favour of the defendant, as he had been seen arguing face to face with his father. Of course, the old man could have turned his back before he was hit. Still, this had to be said to Holmes. There was also the word arat, he said when he died. What could it mean? It could not be nonsense. A man who dies suddenly from a blow is usually not rambling. No, these words seem more like an attempt to describe the disaster that had befallen him. But what was he pointing out? I racked my brains to find a possible explanation. There was also the grey suit young McCarthy had seen. If this was true, the killer must have dropped a piece of his suit, probably his coat, while fleeing and returned calmly to pick it up when his son knelt beside his father, his back turned, ten or fifteen steps away. What a mysterious plot! In the end, I decided to rely on Sherlock Holmes' intuition and wait for fresh evidence to strengthen young McCarthy's innocence. When Sherlock Holmes returned, it was quite late. Lestrade had come alone because he had stayed in one of the town's houses. The barometer is still very high, he said after sitting down. It's important that it didn't rain before going to the scene. On the other hand, one must be in a good mood to handle such a delicate matter, and I can't do it with this long road fatigue. By the way, I saw young McCarthy. And what did you learn from him? Nothing? Couldn't shed any light on anything? Not a bit of it. I thought at one time that he might have been making for it as a place of refuge. I'm sure that he was at sea as to what to do. And I know that he was quite at sea as to what to do. But what the devil has that to do with it? It's not a pretty thing for a man to do. And to see that she is, as I think, pretty much, that is the reason of her being so miserable. Now, if you think of it, her mother must be a little girl. And the man is, as you see, and not to know what the name of the young man is, it is not so bad. The last time I ever did. He was at home and I had a good deal of a gentleman as he was so much as a thing that was to be a thing to be a thing to be a thing. But what do you think of him as a thing to be? We're back to deductions and reasoning, Lestrade said, winking at me. I find it difficult to deal with facts without chasing theories and fantasies. You're right, Holmes said solemnly. You struggle with dealing with facts. By the way, I've learned a truth that you might find hard to come by, Lestrade added. What's that? The death of Big McCarthy came from the hands of Little McCarthy. All other theories are nonsense. Let's leave all of that for now, Holmes said. Is that the left Hatherley farm? Yes, sir, it is. 
It was a large, comfortable-looking, two-storey building, its walls covered in yellow lichen, but with its closed curtains and smokeless chimneys, it looked abandoned. It was as if the weight of this curse was still on it. We knocked on the door, and Holmes asked the servant to show us a pair of boots that his master wore on the day he died, and a pair of his son's boots. After carefully measuring them from seven or eight different angles, we entered the path leading from the courtyard to Boscombe Lake. When Holmes caught the scent, he seemed to transform. Only those who had seen the quiet thinker and logician in Baker Street would have difficulty recognising him. His face would flush and darken. His eyes would gleam like steel from beneath his two dark lines of brows. His face would turn downwards. His shoulders would stoop. His lips would be pressed together, and the veins on his long, nervous neck would stand out one by one. His nostrils would enlarge with the desire of a hunting animal, and his mind would be entirely concentrated on the problem in front of him. So much so that when he was asked a question or someone expressed an idea, he either did not hear it or responded quickly and impatiently with a growl. We swiftly and quietly traversed the path stretching through the meadows towards Boscombe Lake from the forest direction. The ground was as damp and muddy as in the entire area, and there were many footprints on both the road and the grass on either side. Sometimes Holmes would hurry, and sometimes he would stand still. He took a small tour around the meadow. Lestrade and I followed him. Lestrade had adopted an indifferent and arrogant attitude, but I knew that all of his movements were directed towards a specific purpose so I watched my friend with interest. Boscombe Lake, covered with light reeds, was about 50 metres wide, located between Hatherley Farm and Mr Turner's private park. In the distance, through the trees, one could see the pointed red domes of the wealthy landowner's house. On the Hatherley side of the lake, the trees were dense, and there was a narrow strip about 20 yards wide between the reed-lined perimeter of the lake and the trees. Lestrade showed us the spot where the body was found. The ground was so wet that I could clearly see the marks left where the man had fallen. From Holmes's careful scrutiny, I understood that he was reading more than just the crushed grass. He scurried around like a dog, tracking a scent, and finally turned to the detective. Why did you go into the lake? he asked. I was looking for any traces of a weapon or something else using a rake. But how do you... Shh! I don't have time for that now. The faint imprints of his left foot, slightly inward, are everywhere. Even a mole could have seen this. Then they disappear among the reeds. If you hadn't come thrashing about like a herd of cattle, my job would have been much easier. The tracks of those who came with the constable are here. They've obliterated the tracks within a two to three metre radius of the body. But here, there are traces of three separate paths from the same feet. He took out his magnifying glass to get a better look and lay down on the ground in his raincoat. Throughout all this time, he was talking more to himself than to us. These are the footsteps of young McCarthy. He walked twice and ran once. If the impressions of the soles are deeper while the heels are barely visible, it means he ran. This fits with the story he told. He must have run upon seeing his father lying on the ground. These are the tracks left by the father pacing back and forth. But what's this? The son stopped for a moment. The butt of the gun rested on the ground as he listened to voices. And this? Ha ha. Look here. Toes. Toes. Angular and quite unusual boots. They're coming, going, coming again. Of course, for the cloak. But where are they coming from? Tracking the trail intermittently, he dashed about until he finally reached the shade of a large beech tree at the edge of the forest. He circled around it from end to end then exclaimed in delight as he lay face down on the ground once more. He remained there for a long time. He lifted leaves and dry branches, put some objects resembling dust into an envelope, and examined both the ground and the bark of the tree through his magnifying glass. He also examined a stone in the midst of the moss. Then he walked along the path through the forest until all the tracks disappeared. It was indeed a very interesting case, he said. He had returned to his usual demeanour. The house on the right must be the keeper's house. I want to talk to Moran, or at least leave a note. After I do that, I'll join you shortly. Walk to the car. I'll catch up with you in a moment. Within ten minutes, we had gathered in the car and started towards Ross. 
Holmes still held the stone he had taken from the forest. Lestrade, this might interest you, he said, extending the stone. The murder was committed with this. I don't see any marks. There aren't any. Then how do you know? It had grass underneath. It must have been there for only a few days. There were no signs on top of it, which fits with the injuries. Besides, there's no trace of another weapon. And the murderer? Tall, left-handed, limps on his right leg, wears thick-soled hunting boots and a grey cloak, smokes an Indian cigar, uses a cigar holder, and carries an old pocket knife. There are other clues, but that's enough, Lestrade chuckled. I'm afraid my suspicions still linger. Theories are all well and good, but we have to contend with a thick-headed English jury. Nous verons, Holmes replied calmly. You use your methods, I'll use mine. I'll be occupied this afternoon, and will likely return to London on the evening train. Will you leave the matter unfinished then? No, it's already concluded. And the culprit? The gentleman I just described. But who is he? He won't be hard to find. It's not such a populous area around here. Lestrade shrugged. I'm a practical man, he said, and I'm not going to town to search for a left-handed gentleman. I disgrace Scotland Yard. No problem, Holmes said quietly. I've given you the opportunity. Here we are at your lodging. Goodbye. I'll send you a telegram before I leave. We parted ways with Lestrade and went back to our hotel. Lunch awaited us. Holmes sat silently with a pained expression on his face, as if grappling with an insurmountable situation. Listen, Watson, he said after the table was cleared. Sit in that chair and let me tell you. I don't know what to do and I need your advice. Light up a cigar and listen. Please continue. In this case, in the story of young McCarthy, there were two points I thought favoured me and you thought favoured against me. One was the father signalling without seeing his son and the other was his last words before dying. He said other things, but his son only caught these. Now our investigation should start from these two points. Let's assume everything the young man said was entirely true. It was indeed a very interesting case, he said. He had returned to his usual demeanour. The house on the right must be the keeper's house. I want to talk to Moran, or at least leave a note. After I do that, I'll join you shortly. Walk to the car. I'll catch up with you in a moment. Within ten minutes we had gathered in the car and started towards Ross. Holmes still held the stone he had taken from the forest. Lestrade, this might interest you, he said, extending the stone. The murder was committed with this. I don't see any marks. There aren't any. Then how do you know? It had grass underneath. It must have been there for only a few days. There were no signs on top of it which fits with the injuries. Besides, there's no trace of another weapon. And the murderer? Tall, left-handed, limps on his right leg, wears thick-soled hunting boots and a grey cloak, smokes an Indian cigar, uses a cigar holder, and carries an old pocket knife. There are other clues, but that's enough. Lestrade chuckled. I'm afraid my suspicions still linger. Theories are all well and good. But we have to contend with a thick-headed English jury. Nous verons, Holmes replied calmly. You use your methods, I'll use mine. I'll be occupied this afternoon and will likely return to London on the evening train. Will you leave the matter unfinished then? No, it's already concluded. And the culprit? The gentleman I just described? But who is he? He won't be hard to find. It's not such a populous area around here. Lestrade shrugged. I'm a practical man, he said, and I'm not going to town to search for a left-handed gentleman. I disgrace Scotland Yard. No problem, Holmes said quietly. I've given you the opportunity. Here we are at your lodging. Goodbye. I'll send you a telegram before I leave. We parted ways with Lestrade and went back to our hotel. Lunch awaited us. Holmes sat silently with a pained expression on his face as if grappling with an insurmountable situation. Listen, Watson, he said after the table was cleared. Sit in that chair and let me tell you. I don't know what to do, and I need your advice. Light up a cigar and listen. Please continue. In this case, in the story of young McCarthy, there were two points I thought favoured me and you thought favoured against me. One was the father signalling without seeing his son, and the other 
was his last words before dying. He said other things, but his son only caught these. Now our investigation should start from these two points. Let's assume everything the young man said was entirely true. Then where did that kui sound come from? He couldn't have directed it at his son. He thought his son was in Bristol. The hearing distance was purely coincidental. He made that sound to attract the attention of the man he was meeting. But this kui sound is unique to Australia, used among Australians. Therefore, it's highly probable that the man McCarthy was meeting at Boscombe Pool had lived in Australia. What does Arat mean? Sherlock Holmes took out a folded piece of paper from his pocket and spread it out on the table. This is a map of the Victoria colony, he said. I requested it from Bristol last night. He placed his finger on a particular region of the map. What do you read? Arat, I said. And now, he said, lifting his hand, Ballarat. Exactly. In fact, that's what the man said, but his son only heard the last two syllables. The killer was trying to say the name, so it's something related to Ballarat. Excellent, I exclaimed. It's all very clear now. I've narrowed down the area significantly. If we accept the son's statement as accurate, there's also a grey suit involved. Therefore, our investigation now leads us to describe an Australian who lived in Ballarat wearing a grey cloak. Absolutely. And there must be someone from this area, because the lake is accessible either from the farm or the surrounding land, and strangers can't easily enter these areas. True. Then there's today's examination. After examining the ground, I have a description I've given to that fool Lestrade as well. But how did you obtain this information? You know my method. It's based on observing details. I know you roughly deduced his height from a step. The boots could be guessed from their tracks. Yes, they were peculiar boots. And the limp. The imprint of his right foot was always less distinct than that of his left. He put less weight on that foot. Why? Because he limped. And the left-handedness? You read the doctor's report about the manner of injury. The blow was delivered squarely from behind, but to the left side of the skull. Who else could have done such a thing but a left-handed person? The killer was hiding behind the tree during the altercation between the father and son. He even smoked a cigar. Based on my knowledge of tobaccos, I identified that the ash belonged to an Indian cigar. You know I have some expertise in this area. After finding the ash, I looked around and found a cigar butt among the moss. It was one of those tightly rolled Indian cigars from Rotterdam. And what about the cigar holder? I noticed the cigar butt hadn't touched the lips. This meant he used a cigar holder. The end wasn't bitten but cut, and the cut was rough, leading me to deduce a blunt-ended knife. Holmes, I said, you've woven a net from which the criminal cannot escape. By cutting the rope, you've saved an innocent man's life. I can see where all this is pointing. The culprit. Mr. John Turner, shouted the hotel servant, opening our door to admit a guest. The man who entered was a strange and impressive figure. His slow, limping steps indicated a man who had fallen on hard times, yet his rugged, deeply lined face and large frame suggested he still possessed some former strength. His unkempt beard, greying hair and thick eyebrows lent him an air of authority and power, but his face had turned chalk white, with blue marks around his lips and nose. I could tell at first glance that he was gripped by a deadly illness. Please, take a seat on the sofa, Holmes said gently. Did you receive my note? Yes, the guard delivered it. You wish to see me here to prevent a scandal, replied Mr. Turner. I thought it might attract unwanted attention if I were to go to court, Holmes explained. And why did you want to see me? His questions seemed rhetorical, his tired eyes looking hopeless. Yes. Holmes said, responding more to the look than the words. Indeed, I know everything about McCarthy. The old man buried his face in his hands. God help me, he exclaimed, but I wasn't going to let the young man be ruined. If the court had ruled against him, I would have come forward and told everything. I'm very glad to hear that, Holmes said solemnly. I would have told sooner if not for my dear daughter. But if she hears I've been arrested, it would break her heart. 
We may not reach that point, Holmes assured him. How so? I'm not an official detective. I came here at your daughter's request, and I'm working in her interests. Nonetheless, young McCarthy must be released. I'm slowly dying, said old Turner. I've been in the grip of diabetes for years. My doctor says I have at most a month to live, but I'd prefer to die under my own roof than in prison. Holmes rose and sat at the table. Taking a pen and a stack of paper, he said, Just tell the truth. I'll write, you'll sign, and Watson will witness. If things go awry, we'll use your confession to save young McCarthy. I promise not to use it unless absolutely necessary. I don't even know if I'll live until the trial, Turner said. But I don't want to disappoint Alice. Now I'll tell you everything. If it's a story that spans many years, I'll make it short. You wouldn't know this late McCarthy. It was the devil himself. Believe me, may God protect everyone from such a man. He's been hanging around me for twenty years, ruining my life. First, let me tell you how I got caught in his trap. In the 1860s, I was working in the mines. I was a young man, ready to jump into anything, warm-hearted and reckless. I fell in with bad company, took to drink, and became a highwayman hiding in the bushes. There were six of us, leading a wild, free life. We roamed from station to station, robbing mine cars to make a living. At that time, I was known as Black Jack from Ballarat, and our group was known as the Ballarat Gang. One day, we attacked a gold convoy from Ballarat to Melbourne. We were six against six soldiers, so it seemed easy. We emptied four cars, but before we could take all the loot, three of our friends were killed. I held my gun to the head of the car driver, who was McCarthy, but I spared his life. I wish I had killed him then and there, but I didn't. I spared his life. I still remember his evil gaze fixed on me. We took the gold and left for England without getting caught. We were rich now. I parted ways with my friends there and decided to build a quiet and respectable life for myself. I bought this land I found and started doing good things with my money. I got married and although my wife died at a young age, she left me my little sweet Alice. Even as a tiny baby, I felt her tiny hands were leading me on the right path. I started my life anew and did everything I could to erase my past. Everything was going well, until McCarthy showed up. When I came down to town to deal with an investment, I met him on Regent Street. He was in a sorry state. Here we are again, Jack, he said, grabbing my arm. We'll be a family now. There are just two of us, my son and I. You can look after us. Of course, if you want to do something, this is England. There is law and police. There was no way to get rid of them, so they moved west and settled in the best land without rent. There was no more peace and quiet for me. No matter where I turned, I saw his sneaky, smiling face. As Alice grew, things got worse, for he was more afraid of my daughter finding out about my past than the police. I gave him everything he wanted, without asking a single question. Land, money, home. To the point of asking for something I couldn't give, Alice. Her, oh, his son had grown up too. He thought it would be best for his son to have all my property, but I was determined. I didn't want his disgusting, poisonous family involved in mine. I was determined to protect my daughter. McCarthy threatened me. I told him he would never leave me alone, I said. I arranged to meet in the lake between our houses to discuss this issue. When I got there, I saw him talking to his son. I sat behind a tree and waited for him to be alone, smoking a cigar. But when I heard what they were saying, I began to feel something boiling inside me. He was forcing his son to marry my daughter, as if she were a street whore. The thought that all the things I valued were under the control of this man's hands drove me crazy. Couldn't I break that bond? I was already a desperate man with one foot in the grave. Even though I knew my mind and body were still strong, I knew my fate was already written. And what about my past and my daughter? If I could shut up this ugly mouth, they'd all be saved. I did that, Mr. Holmes. If I had to do it again, I would. I've done great sins and sacrificed myself to atone for them. 
but I couldn't stand the thought of my daughter being tied to the same tree. I shot him without pity like a disgusting, venomous animal. With a scream, his son came back, but I had already hid behind the tree. I went back for the last time to pick up my coat. This is the true story of what happened, gentlemen. It's not my job to judge you, said Holmes, after the old man signed the statement in front of him. My only wish is that such a thing doesn't happen to anyone. Nor mine, sir. So what are you thinking about? Considering your health, nothing. Soon you will have to account to the highest court. As you yourself know, we will keep your secret and use McCarthy only if he is guilty. Otherwise, whether you are alive or not, your secret will be kept. Goodbye then, said the old man solemnly. Thank you for giving me this peace. He came out of the room, shivering and trembling with that huge body. May God help us, Holmes said after a long silence. Why is fate playing such games with poor, helpless creatures? When I come across a case like this, I can't help but think of Baxter's words and tell myself, here he comes, coming in the name of God to Sherlock Holmes. Holmes has successfully defended James McCarthy by refuting all objections. Old Turner died seven months after our conversation. I hope the son and daughter are doing well, knowing nothing about those dark clouds that covered up.